class. Glad you could join us, glad you tuned in, whether you're online or on TV. And for those of you who showed up this morning and are in your seats and ready for Sabbath school, God bless you. Thank you for being here. What we're going to do is we're going to stop for a moment and we're going to have a word of prayer. Please bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we're grateful for this opportunity that you give us to once again talk about your word. Father, enlighten us. Give us understanding. This is your time. You speak to us, Lord. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, do we pray. Amen. Thank you all for being here. We're going to study our Sabbath school lesson today, and we're not obviously going to go so deeply because I would assume, and I, I think I'm assuming correctly, that we've all studied our lessons at home. Someone should have said amen. <laughs> so we are not going to go, uh, we can't go too deep because if we try to go too deep, our time is going to run out. And quite frankly, the Word of God requires more reverence than a simple skimming of the lesson. So I know all of you studied your lessons at home. And so we're going to begin by going over it uh, as an overview. Now, the title of this week's lesson was The Bible and Prophecy. Now, when you hear other Christians talk about the Bible, do you always hear them mention prophecy? I would submit to you that for the most part, people, including Adventists, have a hard time with this part of reading their Bibles because prophecy involves two things that I personally didn't like growing up, and perhaps you either. One of them is history. Yes, growing up, I did not enjoy history. Uh, I just didn't like remembering the dates and the names and what war was fought where and when. I just didn't enjoy it. But the other thing that I didn't enjoy was the numbers. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm good with numbers. I can handle numbers. But those were the two things that kept me away from studying uh, prophecy as a kid. It was the number portion, the, the, the math, and the history. As an adult, and now I see the benefits of understanding uh, prophecy, of understanding history. And so now with that leading me, I can understand the importance of understanding prophecy uh, in my daily life. Now, in Sabbath's, uh, Sabbath's lesson for the Sabbath school, there's a memory text, and it says, And he said unto me, Unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Thank you, both of you, for saying that. So we as Adventists know this verse, right? We understand it well, and we understand, at least we should, right? We understand the timeline of the 2300 days. We understand the prophecy of the 70 weeks and then the week in the mid that was cut off. So we understand these things. But what is the purpose of prophecy? We're going to touch on that today. What is the purpose of prophecy? Now, there are two uh, real reasons for prophecy, but before we understand what those reasons are, what is prophecy anyway? What is prophecy, and why is it such a big deal? I mean, there are lots of people out there who tell the future, aren't there? Aren't there people out there who you dial a number and you pay by the five minutes or something like that where someone can tell you what the future is? Yeah, see, that's a little bit different than what we go over. There is a golden cord that goes through the entire Bible, and that is the prophecy. And that's what separates it. See, there are many other good books that you can read. There are many other good books that tell you, you know, how to love your neighbors and, you know, uh, how to maybe improve yourself, carry your cross. Yes, there are many books uh, that have even poetry that, that, that are beautiful, that sing God's praises, uh, or you can use to, to, uh, to romance your future husband or your wife. But there is only one book, there is only one book that tells you today what's going to happen 500 years from now, and that's the Bible. Someone should have said, Amen. The Bible is the only book that says what's going to happen and how accurate it's going to be, and it's something that we can all rely on. We can rely on the Bible because when God says this is going to happen... It happens, doesn't it? So far, everything he has said that would happen has happened. 
100% of it. Now, you have other people around the world giving predictions and giving prophecies, and you know how often they're wrong? 100% of the time. Because so far, the only predictions that seem to work are the ones that say, read these cards, and you know what? You're going to die in about six days. That'll be $50. And then, of course, because the enemies, uh, you're now on the, on the enemy's turf, the enemy makes it so that it does happen, and you put yourself in a, in a bad situation. But with God, it's different. When God tells us the future, he's got two purposes for it. One of them is found in John 14, 29. And if you can turn to it, turn to it quickly, because we are going to go rather quickly. In John 14, 29, Jesus says, And now I have told you before it comes to pass, that when it does come to pass, you might believe. So one of the purposes for God teaching us prophecy is to help us believe. Because we're kind of an incredulous bunch sometimes, aren't we? But he says, look, I'm telling you right now, so that when it does happen, you'll believe, and you'll want to believe me again. You'll want to hear more of what I say, because I've got something to say to you that's going to help you. It's for your benefit. The other purpose for knowing prophecy let me go backwards. I'm going to employ a double negative. There is absolutely, positively no other reason other than these two for knowing prophecy. The first one, so that you might believe, and the second one, so that you change something today. Because there is absolutely no use knowing that maybe next week I'm going to run a red light and get into a car accident if I don't do something on that day to prevent it from happening. If we don't change what we do today, there's no point in knowing the future. God is telling us the future so that we can make adjustments in our lives and so that we can do things uh, that will make it something good that God gave us the time that he did. We're going to go into the next day's lesson, but we're going to skip Sunday for the moment. I know that's not normally the protocol, but there's a purpose for it. We're going to go into Monday's lesson. So if you have your lesson with you, which I'm assuming you do, whether it's electronic or on paper, those of you at home, please follow along. We're going into Monday's lesson, not Sunday, Monday's lesson, and we're going to come back around. Monday's lesson is titled, The Year Day Principle. Now, we don't have a lot of time, so if you have to just write down the verses, go ahead. But the year-date principle is something that's employed in order to help us figure out these prophecies. Now, where did we get this year-date principle? Well, if you look at your lesson, there's a couple of references. One of them is in, uh, is the, in Numbers 14.34, and it says, according to, the numbers of, excuse me, according to the number of the days in which you spied out the land, 40 days... For each day you shall bear your guilt one year, namely 40 years, and you shall know my rejection. Who's he talking to here? He's speaking to the Israelites, isn't he? He says, remember when you guys went out and spied out the land and, you know, you, you, you gave a bad report? Well, because of that, for the 40 days, you're going to have another, four, you're going to have 40 years, one year for each day. Now, Israel, kind of a stubborn bunch, right? Are we Israel in that aspect sometimes? Yeah, I would suggest that most of the time, beginning with me, yes, we are stubborn. So, the Israel, we are modern-day Israel, aren't we? The next reference that we're given is in Ezekiel 4.6, and this one is very, very interesting because when you read the account of poor Ezekiel of what he had to do, oh, oh my goodness, it's something that I wouldn't uh, recommend any of you doing or you having to do. God gave Ezekiel a specific instruction. He said, this is what you're going to go do. When you have completed them, he had given him a time, lie again on your right side. He had told them, lie on one side, and now you're going to lie on the other side. Then you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Judah 40 days. I have laid a, uh, on you a day for each year. So, these, this is the year-to-day principle that we have, and many of you have already understood this, right? For each day, we get a year, and this is the mechanism that we use to understand prophecy. This is important. 
The reason that this is important is because God uses symbols. He used symbols in order to teach us what he wants us to understand. And so when he uses these symbols, he says, look, I'm giving you a time frame. And in that time frame, the only way that it could be measured out properly is if I give it to you in symbols. Because if I gave it to you any other way, you wouldn't understand it. And so the reason that this is important is because if we don't use this year-to-date principle we're going to come up with some kooky dates. Because at one point, the prophecies tell us 2,300 days. Well, if you think about 2,300 days, that's not very, a very long time, right? And he's saying all of these things, the sanctuary is going to be cleansed, and after that, Jesus will come back. And that would have been a couple thousand years ago that that happened. So we have to use the year-to-date principle. The other problem with not using the year-to-date principle is this. We have in modern society some beliefs, and, and, they're, and they're a little strange. And some of these beliefs include taking this 2300-day prophecy, taking that 70-week prophecy that's in, that's in there, and then taking that last week of the 70-week prophecy and skipping a couple thousand years and adding it to the very end. Now, that doesn't make much sense, right? How would it feel if I said, hey, listen, come to dinner at my house a week from today. Okay, Sabbath afternoon. You come to my house and you show up and I say, no, you didn't understand. See, that seventh day, that that week, you were supposed to come after six days, but don't don't count seven. You're supposed to wait another week after that and then you add the seventh day. Well, what kind of sense does that make? And because of that mechanism, that mechanism, that false mechanism that I just said has been employed, we get these strange beliefs that we're going to be secretly raptured and our clothes is going to be left behind somewhere on a bus or a plane or in our house or something like that. That's exactly the error that we don't want to teach. Now, God in his wisdom... He used these symbols, he used these mechanisms for us to understand. And he made them understandable for us because, I mean, I think I've said this before, quite frankly, God in his infinite wisdom, in order to get us to understand things, he kind of had to dumb it down for us a little bit, didn't he? Kind of had to make it so that we could understand in our finite brains what it is that he wanted to teach us. So he gave us this linear form of understanding his word. Now, we're going to move on to Tuesday's lesson because we have very little time. This lesson of the uh, linear time of prophecy helps us to understand a few things. It helps us understand and identify key actors in the Bible. And some of these key actors in the Bible are inexistent and, 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 and they're alive and well today. Tuesday's lesson talks about identifying the little horn. Now, how many of us have heard of the little horn? Well, we're all Adventists, right? I saw two hands. I thought every hand was going to go up in the air. If you're at home, I'm sure you've heard of the little horn. Thank you. Fantastic. I'm glad I'm not up here by myself. We, are, we know who the little horn is, and that little horn is identified in Daniel 7 and 8. Again, this isn't an exhaustive study because the clock says 14 minutes and 4 seconds, 3 seconds, 2 seconds, so we just don't have time to go into it. But that's all right because, again, we are Adventists. We are people of the book, right? We are people who people don't read their Bible to us. We quote it back to them. That's how well we know our Bibles, right? Because we know the word and we understand how to interpret it. And we should have the ability. Well, I won't get into it now. We'll go back to that later. But in Daniel 7 and 8, there, is, there's, a, a, there are some beasts, right? And as a kid, I thought these were literal beasts that were going to come out of the water and out of the dirt. And I didn't understand that. And it was a bit scary, but also intriguing. And it was kind of amazing. But then there's this little horn that comes up uh, uh, between these other horns. And when you have this little horn, you realize that one's important. You need to know who that little horn is or what it is or both. And when you understand what that little horn is, then you get to know what that horn's agenda is. What that horn wants to 
teach, what that horn wants to preach, what that horn wants you to believe and wants you to disbelieve. There are seven characteristics that are listed in uh, that little horn description in uh, Tuesday's lesson. Again, for those of you at home, we are on Tuesday's lesson. If you just tuned in, we skipped Sundays. We're on Tuesday's lesson. We're going to come back. And it talks about several characteristics of that little horn that are similar or are the same in chapter 7 and 8. Now, chapter 7 and 8 of Daniel talk about Daniel chapter 2 but to, uh, with a more precise, with a more detailed account, right? And so he's telling us that this little horn has a problem. These, these, this little horn in chapter 7 is the same horn in chapter 8, but with more detail in chapter 8. And that chapter 8 little horn, the Bible, when you start reading from 2, 7, and 8... You read these stories, and you read history, you read these visions, you get to understand, and everybody, you're going to be shocked, I know you're going to be very shocked to hear this, that little horn power is none other than the papal power in Rome. Now, please, those of you at home who are listening, if you're not Adventist, don't worry. Don't you worry. We love our Roman Catholic friends. We love our, 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 our Christians, our people in Christ who are in the church, in the Roman Catholic Church. There are faithful, good people in this church. But this is a system that this little horn is describing. It is a system that is saying, hey, there are some teachings and some problems with this system because when you keep reading 7 and 8, it says that this little horn threw down the daily sacrifice. Well, what does that mean? Why should we be worried that the daily sacrifice was thrown down? Well, when you read the sanctuary services, because I know you all have, again, your Adventists, the sanctuary services it consisted of a morning and an evening sacrifice. A sacrifice for thanksgiving, sacrifice for repentance, sacrifice for forgiveness of sins. And who is the only one who can give forgiveness of sins? I heard one tiny little who is the only one who can forgive sins? Jesus Christ himself. The Father has given me all authority even to forgive sin. And so this, this system, this horn says, forget about the daily power. Forget about the daily sacrifice because that represents Jesus. <clears throat> you don't need to go and bother Jesus with your sins. You don't need to go and trouble him with your sins. Go to the priest at your local church Get down in front of him on your knees and tell him your sins, and then he can forgive you. Mm. Dangerous, dangerous. Does that make sense? If I went to Caleb over here behind the camera and I stole his sunglasses, could Max forgive me for that? Absolutely not. I need to ask forgiveness from the one I have offended, in this case, namely, Christ himself. So when we ask for forgiveness, we need to go to him and say, Father, I need you to forgive me. And this little horn wants to, uh, uh, wants to uh, make this not, wants to make this nullified. And so we have to understand who this little horn power is and how he's coming uh, uh, in today's uh, news or in today's events. We have so little time. Wednesday talks about the investigative judgment. Hop on over to Wednesday. We have a little less than nine minutes. And we talk about the 2300-day prophecy, which we've already studied a little bit. The 2300-day prophecy, there's a beginning and an end. There's a beginning time and an end time. And those of you, again, who, who are Sabbath uh, uh, or Seventh-day Adventist historians and, and, and scholars, you all know when it begins. It begins with the rebuilding of Jerusalem. Not the first uh, time they tried to rebuild. Not the second time, but the third time. That's found in Ezra 7-7. You know, the one where the king, or the Xerxes, gave uh, them the credit card, basically, to, to, for Babylon to go and rebuild and, and, and take back Jerusalem. Remember that? And we have some math there that we see as well. And this is beautiful, because when you read this lesson, 
of the 2300-day prophecy and you read the 70-week prophecy that's inserted in there, that 70-week prophecy is prophesying who? In the middle of the week, something happens of the last week. Jesus. It's telling us, thank you, brother, it's telling us, that 70-week prophecy is telling us not only when Jesus will be born, not only when he will be crucified, but it even tells us when he'll be baptized, and then when the message is going to go to the rest of the people, not just the Israelites. When you read this and you compare it to any Google account of history, it confirms exactly what the Bible says. This is the stuff that faith is made of. This is the stuff that when you read it, you can say, whoa. Study it. Read it, these prophecies. Understand them. Be able to preach them to people. In Thursday's lesson, we're now on Thursday's lesson, it's titled Typology as Prophecy. Now, what's typology? It's just a fancy word for symbol, right? We have a type, and then we have an anti-type. Not to be confused with antichrist, type and anti-type. That means we have the, 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 the real thing, and then we have the symbol, and the symbol is the type, right? So if we have a beast, let me go back. If we have a country, let's say Babylon, its symbol or its type was the head on the statue, right? Or the lion. This is the type and the anti-type. We have the serpent in the wilderness, the serpents that the Moses that put up, the bronze serpent. This is the type or the symbol of Jesus Christ being put up on the cross for everyone to see and find healing. We're given a list of various uh, uh, types or symbols in this lesson. Jonah, just as Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days, so must the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days. We have Adam being a type of Christ. We have, in John 1, the lamb. We talked about that a minute ago. The lamb that was brought to sacrifice... That was a symbol of Jesus Christ, and hopefully by the time Jesus Christ was born and came to minister, people should have recognized him. But did they recognize him? That's right. There should have been a resounding no. They did not recognize him. A few did. A few recognized him and were faithful. Do we recognize him? We are named Christians which means we are after the behavior of Christ. So in our daily lives at work or at school or wherever we are, does, do people recognize Christ when they see us? Do they see Christ when they look at me? They should. Can somebody say, you know what, that guy, he, yeah, he's an Adventist, he's a, he's a Christian, and I don't believe in any of that stuff, but you know what? There's something about him. There's something that in this day and age, with all this turmoil, with that everything that's happening, with the four winds coming to, to a climax, they should be able to say, even though he's a Christian and he's kind of kooky, I can rely on him. There's something about the firmness in his character that says, that gives me a calming sense of, 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 of okay, that everything's going to be just fine. I told you we were going to go back. We went to Wednesday, and then we also we went to Thursday. We're going to go back to Sunday's lesson. So we, we skipped Sunday, but we're going to go back for a reason, because all this prophecy, all this understanding, the numbers, the dates, the, the, the beasts, the symbolism, uh, the way understanding the year-date principle, all of these things are important. And they're so important that the title of this lesson is Historicism and Prophecy. Now, all of these symbols began in Daniel 2, and I'm sure everybody's quite familiar with Daniel 2. Amen? I thank you. One amen. All right. One person knows it. Daniel 2. I know all of you do. 
Daniel 2 is where it all begins, but not really. You see, because Daniel 2, in Daniel 2, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. He has a dream. God speaks to him. He doesn't want to listen, but God speaks to him. And you know, normally uh, uh, kings don't want to hear bad news. They want to hear good news. So sometimes the news is filtered. But God comes to him in a dream where he can't escape it. Where all of the systems to protect him from bad news have been torn down and he gets a dream. And then he starts killing a bunch of people off because he wants them not only to tell him the dream, but interpret it. And Daniel says, give me a little bit of time. And so what does he do? He goes and he falls asleep. People are getting their heads lopped off, and Daniel goes and takes a, go, takes a nap. He says, I need to pray, and tomorrow I'll have an answer. And he does. And so he goes to the king, and he says to him, Oh, king, I'm going to tell you the interpretation of the dream. I'm going to tell you the dream, too. And I'm going to tell you the dream. And here's the thing. Daniel begins to tell the king what's going to happen. But before he does, he says, this is what your dream was, and, I'm going, and God is giving me the dream. But now we are going to interpret it for you. And you can find that in Daniel chapter 2, verse 36. He says, we are going to tell you the interpretation of the dream. And I'm sure Nebuchadnezzar's going, what we? It's just Daniel. Daniel knew his God was with him to tell him the bad news that his dream meant that he was not going to be in power forever. That is a scary thing to have to tell the man who rules the earth at the time? Are we willing to tell prophecy as uncomfortable and lack of political correctness as it may contain, are we willing to tell people the news, what's happening, who is where and who is what and what this means? Are we willing to express to them the prophecies of God even at the risk of losing our heads? Nowadays, you can't go out there and say something that disagrees with what somebody else because no matter which side of the spectrum you're on, you're evil if you don't agree with me. But Daniel had the courage, and the reason he had the courage was because in Daniel 1, he had prepared himself. And people think Daniel 1 is just about diet, and it is not. He prepared before. Ladies and gentlemen, our time has run out. I know I'm going over by about 10 seconds, 15 maybe, but we're going to pray. And I pray that we all pray for the courage to speak an unpopular message because it's the truth. Bow your heads with me, please. Heavenly Father, we're grateful and we thank you because you reveal to us what we need to know even if it hurts. Thank you that you love us so much that you're willing to hurt us emotionally to save our souls. Bless every soul under this roof and, and everyone viewing at home. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, do I pray. Amen.